Coming up, an electric supercar that's taking insanity to new levels. Oh, my God! Seats for the super rich made from horses' tails. And the underwater machine that loves to clean. How do they do it? Imagine a car that can surge from 0 to 100 in just over three seconds. <laughs> One that has a top speed of 250 kilometers an hour. Oh my God! But is almost totally silent and doesn't use a drop of gas. <laughs> this could be the future of four-wheel travel. How do they do it? Inside this 500,000 square meter factory in Fremont, California, Tesla Motors are taking on the giants of the auto industry. And they're doing it with an electric car. A hundred years ago, more cars ran on electricity than on gasoline. In fact, Henry Ford's wife refused to drive anything other than an electric car. You know, because of that whole fire and explosion issue that was common with combustion engines of the time. But electric cars were also heavy and slow. They were dismissed as boring. Not anymore. Tesla's Model S may look like a conventional sports sedan, but that's where the resemblance ends. Everything has been done to make this car as light and powerful as possible. Most cars are built from steel. But these giant rolls of metal aren't steel. They're lightweight aluminium. More expensive than steel and tricky to work with, they've chosen aluminium because it cuts the car's body weight by almost 100 kilos, making it faster and more fun to drive. The coils are unraveled and fed into a super-sized guillotine, which chops them into individual panels called blanks. Now the flat blanks need to be pressed into shape. But aluminium doesn't stretch as easily as steel, making it harder to bend and mould. The answer? The largest hydraulic press in North America. This seven-storey, 60-metre-long monster is made up of five stamping presses, which slowly bend and shape the metal. The lead press applies a 1,000 tonnes of force, creating the basic shape. The other presses add the details. Together, they produce a new body panel every six seconds. The components are then brought to the body centre, where the dance of the welding robots begins. No sparks flying on this dance floor. Aluminium has a low melting point, so conventional welding would damage the body panels. Instead, they use a special technique called cold metal transfer welding. It uses just a tenth of the energy, but it's also ten times faster. Once the body shells are welded together, this overhead conveyor system carries them to the paint shop. Here, they're given a good clean. Then the unpainted shell is brought to life. Robotic arms spray every inch with a primer base coat and a final shiny clear coat. The shells are carefully inspected to make sure they have a perfect finish. Tesla hopes this vehicle is going to compete with supercars. But to do that, it needs a lot of pulling power. And that comes from these electric motors. To build each one, they need copper wire almost a kilometre of it. The copper is coiled into three windings, then encased in epoxy, and placed inside a housing. This is the outer part of the motor, called the stator. Next, they place this cylinder, called the rotor, in the middle. When electricity passes through the copper coils on the outside, it creates a rotating magnetic field. This induces another magnetic field in the rotor. 
When the two fields interact, they cause the rotor to spin, which then turns the car's wheels. The principle was first discovered by Croatian-born inventor Nikola Tesla over 130 years ago. This company is named after him. Nikola Tesla is the most awesome inventor ever. He developed modern power generation and distribution, X-ray, radio, remote control. The modern world is built on his work. It's not just the motor's design that's unusual. It's also where they put it. Or rather, where they put them. Because this car has two motors, one mounted directly on the front axle and one on the rear. This means there's no need for the kind of mechanical transmission used by conventional cars, saving yet more weight. And together, those motors deliver a whopping 691 horsepower, almost twice the power of a Porsche 911 Carrera. The term horsepower comes from exactly that, horsepower. Back in the day, they needed a measurement for an engine that people could understand. So one horsepower became the weight of coal that a horse could lift out of a mine multiplied by the speed it could lift it. So this car can do the same as almost 700 coal-dragging horses. But this car won't have any power without electricity. And that comes from this, a massive battery. Each of these lithium-ion battery packs is made up of about 7,000 cells separated into 16 different modules to make that one single 1,200-pound pack. Together, the 7,000 cells can store 85 kilowatt-hours of electricity. Connect that to your smartphone and you could talk non-stop for 288,000 hours. The drawback is that this battery is heavy. It weighs half a tonne. But by mounting it under the floor, they've lowered the car's centre of gravity, making it almost impossible to roll and creating a flat undercarriage, which makes it more streamlined. These batteries are made of lithium. Now, lithium, along with hydrogen and helium, was made in the first three minutes of the universe's existence, which means you're driving around with a little bit of the Big Bang in your car. As the body shell moves down the line, engineers install the dashboard, windscreen, wheels, seats and doors, all with the kind of efficiency an F1 pit crew would be proud of. Completed cars are driven off the end of the line, ready to hit the road. Unlike petrol engines, electric motors instantly convert electricity into turning force. This car's power-to-weight ratio is too much for your average commute. To access all the car's power, the driver has to go to the console and select a special mode labelled Insane. And what does Insane mode feel like? Car Magazine Drag Times put it to the test. Oh, my God! Oh, oh my God! There you go. Okay. Holy That's I mean... awesome! Still to come, seats for the super rich made from horses' tails. And the underwater robot that loves to eat dirt. How do they do it? To a horse, a tail is a giant fly swatter. To mankind, it's long been a source of fabric. In the Middle Ages, monks wore itchy horsehair shirts as a penance. Some even wore horsehair underwear. It may have been uncomfortable to wear, but it made the perfect covering for fine furniture. Soon, it was the choice for family seats all over Europe. Today, it's even made it into the White House. But processing horsehair is an epic tale. How do they do it? Castle Carey in Somerset, England. A textile town that's been weaving its way into history since 1327. 
continuing that tradition today is John Boyd Textiles. This is one of only a handful of factories worldwide that still produce horsehair fabric. Company director Anna Smith runs the whip over her 13 employees. They're looking for a fabric that's very durable, very hard wearing, it's got a very unusual sheen to it. And there's probably no other natural fabric which has the same sort of properties as horsehair fabric. Before cushioning the derrieres of premieres, the bundles of hair go through a process that has changed little since these looms were built way back in 1872. This company only just survived the invention of the motor car. All their horse hair comes from live working horses because hair from dead horses is just too brittle. The motor car put an end to their local supply of horse hair, but now they just ship it in from the Far East. The hair arrives in bundles, each containing thousands of individual strands. It's up to Duncan Brummel to unpack them. If you think you've had a mare at work today, spare a thought for Duncan. He's been having one every day for 25 years. It feels nice, actually, to, to be doing something which has uh, been going on for so many years and sort of be part of that, part of his history. However, some of the hairs are knotted, and if they're not untangled, they can't be woven properly. So they're passed to Tina Scott. She runs them through what looks like a medieval torture device. These vicious-looking spikes untangle the hair and remove any shorter strands. Back in the 19th century, this process used to be known as heckling. In those days, a heckler wasn't someone who shouted insults at comedians. It was someone who teased out horsehair. The next problem is that there are some darker hairs mixed in with the lighter ones. And a president won't want a black line on his cream chaise long. The job of finding the rogue ones falls to Julie Underdown. If you thought searching for a needle in a haystack was a tough gig, try picking your way through this bundle. When Julie has combed through the lots, they're ready for weaving. But horsehair is too wiry and slippery to be woven on its own. Joe Miller has the answer. From these cones of cotton, she's drawing out 40 separate strands. These will run the length of the cloth, forming what's known as the warp. The horsehair will run across the fabric, weaving up and down through the cotton threads, forming the weft. As the cotton strands are wound onto the ancient drum, Joe knows one snap thread could see the company lose money quicker than on a 100 to 1 shot in the derby. If I take my eyes off of it and the end goes, the whole thing will have to be taken off and starting again. Soon Joe's created a 75 centimetre wide roll of threads ready for weaving but it's much too big to fit on the loom. So she attaches the cotton to something called a beam before rolling the lot on. Now it's just the right width to be woven with the 65 centimetre long horse hairs. Horses' tails can grow really long and the length varies between breed and even color. It might sound crazy, but black horses have slightly longer tails than white ones do. Gary Thomas then carries the beam to the weaving shed. With Duncan's help, they attach it to the loom. But tying all the threads individually would take all day. So he uses this nifty little device called a knotting machine, which automatically ties each one on. Two thousand threads later, they fire it up. The loom lifts every second warp thread, creating a gap running the width of the cloth. A device called a rapier draws a strand of horsehair through the gap. Then the loom swaps the threads over, locking the weft in place and creating a new gap for the next strand of horsehair to be drawn through. It takes 35 hairs to make one centimetre of fabric. When Queen Elizabeth was crowned in 1953, she wore an incredibly elaborate embroidered dress. The taffeta skirt was reinforced with stiff fabric made from horse hair and linen, which stopped it from losing its shape. The next challenge is removing any loose threads. And that's done by Jo. And a beard trimmer she seems to have borrowed from Duncan. The fabric is now smooth, but it's lacking the shiny finish unique to horse hair products, known 
as the sheen. So it's placed between boards and handed over to these guys. They place a stack in this ancient screw press, then weigh it down with heated metal slabs. By repeating this process, they create a multi-layered horsehair and hot metal sandwich. Then, they begin to apply some pressure. This means using what may be the country's biggest spanner and a bit of elbow grease. This combination of heat and pressure gives the fabric its sheen. Screw presses became common in wealthy households in the 17th and 18th century. They were used to press linen napkins and tablecloths, and they also became something of a status symbol. After a night in the screw press, the cloth is passed to Gemma Leahy for a final check. We have to look through the cloth for any broken hairs, for any oil marks, because obviously the, the looms are old, because then it'll come up as a fault. These textiles are sent around the world, from Somerset to the White House. So, if Mr President looks like he's feeling a little hoarse, blame it on the furnishings. Just when you think it's safe to go into the water, you remember that hundreds of people have been in there first. On average, each swimmer sheds about three grams of organic matter, like skin, hair, and other stuff I don't even want to get into. Luckily, there's something that seems to love feeding on your bits of dirt, dead skin, and hair. Robot pool cleaners. It picks up everything. Dirt, sand, gold earrings. Very clever machine. Each is cast using age-old techniques and then assembled using cutting-edge science. How do they do it? Sweden in winter doesn't have much in common with a warm swimming pool. But here in Quicksund, at the Sedenborgs foundry, our pool cleaner begins life. Inside, these guys are busy keeping out the cold by casting the cleaner's main components. To do that, they need to make moulds. And that's done using batches of sand which they first sieve to remove any lumps. They use sand because it can hold hot metal and because the gaps between the grains let out any hot gases and moisture. This is a master copy of the part they need to cast. This machine compresses two trays of sand around it and then removes it, leaving a part-shaped hollow inside. Henrik Helm drills access holes into the mould so they can pour molten metal inside. Here, they use bars of light, corrosion-resistant aluminium. The challenge is melting them. That's where Berger Rupp comes in. He's busy mixing up a superheated 700 degrees Celsius cauldron of molten aluminium. Berger ladles out a load and carries it across to the casting line, very carefully. Next, he pours it into the drilled hole, filling every cubic centimetre of the hollow inside. The parts are then left to cool and set for four hours. Rasmus Bergvist can now use a kind of shaking sieve to break the moulds apart. And as the sand falls away, a newly cast piece of aluminium is born. When all the parts have been cast, they're sent here, to the Veda factory in nearby Surditalia. Darko Mucic begins the assembly process by clamping the freshly cast main body in place. Next, he inserts the rotor, the part which spins in the middle of the motor to move the cleaner across the pool. Darko fixes the motor over the transmission and screws it down tightly to ensure it's watertight. The motor powers these wheels. Now the cleaner needs something to clean with, so he attaches a 60 centimetre long cylindrical brush and links it to the wheels with a rubber belt. The next problem is finding a way to hoover up the dirt the brushes remove. That's done by this pump, which can suck up dirty water at a rate of 1,200 litres per minute. 
That's 15 bathtubs of water. This suction is so powerful, it means the cleaner can cling to the pool walls, like a scum-sucking super snail. The team now fix on the back set of wheels and second brush. This is followed by the bottom panel. Finally, they fit the tubes that'll carry the dirt away from the brushes and tracks that can grip to the slipperiest of pool tiles. On land, the cleaner weighs over 50 kilos, but in the water, it's effectively just seven, thanks to the buoyancy provided by this plastic and foam cover. The final problem is finding something to collect all the dirt this super sucker eats up. So they attach this double-layer nylon filter bag to the top. Nylon was invented back in the 1930s, which was just in time because it played a massive role in World War II. Before nylon, all parachutes had to be made of silk collected from Asian silkworms, and the war cut off supplies. Before it's sent off for packaging, the guys here need to check the cleaner works. To do that, they maintain one of the filthiest swimming pools in Sweden on site. Like Aquaman's Hoover, the robot scrapes up the dirt, sucks it in, and then spits it out into the nylon bag. While a watching Jan finds it hard to contain his excitement. The cleaning work has been successful, so we are happy. All that remains is to shrink wrap the contraption in plastic, And this robot is ready to spend its days bottom-feeding at your local pool. Lucky fella.